Today on Under the Big Tree, designing and building a portable electronic music studio based on modules from 1010 Music. I travel a decent amount and almost always take a synthesizer with me. I know, big surprise, huh? Anyway, the choice of synth rests on some obvious criteria. It can't be too big being able to fit in an overhead compartment on a plane. It has to be both protected and rugged to withstand the inevitable jostling and impacts of travel. And it has to be full-featured enough to allow me to really dig in and make some music. Most of the time, my choice is my Buchla music easel, along with a small audio interface and a laptop. I've also schlepped my Kima system around in a beat-up Anvil briefcase I found at a surplus store. And last year, I brought my Buchla Skylab to a calm and peaceful lake in upstate New York, where I composed a 45-minute piece called Cuca, just using the Skylab, Reaper, and my trusty Valhalla reverb and delay plugins. You can find it for free on my Bandcamp page. I'm recording this video in August of 2022, and I've just completed an hour-long set of abstract electronic music for the Modulisma label. You'll be able to hear it up there starting this November. But between that, the previous year's piece, several performances done this year, and all my videos on modular synths, I was ready for a little break from abstract experimental electronic music. I was actually ready to revisit the hallowed land of notes, melodies, chords, chord progressions, structure, and my skills at playing the keyboard. For inspiration, I thought about Tangerine Dream, Klaus Schultz, and the Berlin School aesthetic in general. Okay, great direction for my next album. With a couple of trips coming up, I decided I would build a portable electronic music studio to realize that style of music. It had to fit the rules I laid out above, and had to minimize the amount of time spent setting things up and putting them away. Finally, I wanted it to look neat, so I could look at the gear and not all the cabling. And it had to be pretty cheap to put together. So with all that in mind, the heart of the system was a no-brainer. I'm a huge fan of 1010 Music and their products, and already own a black box sampler sequencer, a blue box mixer recorder, and a nanobox fireball wavetable synthesizer. All of these instruments are small and quite powerful. I knew I needed some more synths and an input device, but those would come later. The next thing to figure out was the case to store it all. I wanted something cheap and sturdy that was easily hackable, and Harbor Freight had the perfect solution, a metal and plastic briefcase toolbox that was just about the right size for what I needed and cost a whopping 35 bucks. Sold! With that choice made, I started to lay out the synths and needed to find a MIDI keyboard controller that would fit in the case. My choice was an Arturia Mini Lab Mark II, which has loads of controls and was on sale at Perfect Circuit in Burbank for 80 bucks. Then I needed more synth power in a small package and that came in the form of a multi-tambral German powerhouse, the Waldorf Blofeld. It had some of the DNA of the legendary PPG Wave, was built like a tank, fit the case, and was indeed designed and made in the land of the Berlin School. I found one in mint condition on Craigslist for $300, and that was that. Noisemakers, check. Now it was time to think about MIDI and sequencing. My original plan was to drive everything from the black box. It has a USB input for the Arturia keyboard and a nice sequencer that can drive both its internal sample pads and external MIDI devices. And while I really wanted to have a hardware only setup, in the end, I added my ancient MacBook Air running Reaper for sequencing. It was easier on my vintage eyeballs and big fingers. The compromise was that I would use the laptop for MIDI only, no audio recording or processing. That would happen on the Blue Box Mixer Recorder. I knew there wasn't room to store the laptop in the case with everything else, but since I always brought one anyway, no big deal to carry it in a different bag. I then realized that I could create sequences on the Mac, then export them as standard MIDI files and put them on the black box for performance. One small problem, though. I have an unpowered MIDI through box that relies on power from the MIDI connection itself, and I couldn't get it to send out MIDI from the black box. I suspect that 3.5mm tip ring sleeve MIDI connections don't supply the power required. 
If I want to use black box as the primary sequencer in the future, I can simply replace the MIDI through box with a powered one. So, the plan shaped itself over several days, with little details getting polished in my head before physical construction began. When in use, the case would be open, and the keyboard and laptop would be just to the right, with the laptop right behind the keyboard. The keyboard would connect to the laptop via a USB cable, and another cable would connect the laptop to a small USB MIDI interface in the system. The interface connected to a small, unpowered MIDI through box, which then sent MIDI to the synths. I would set up a template in Reaper with separate tracks for the various musical elements that would then be routed to the correct MIDI device. There is a free plugin that comes with Reaper called Mega Baby that helps turn it into a full featured step sequencer. For power, I put a simple power strip in the case, with the power transformers plugged in and hidden from view. All audio is routed to the blue box for mixing, recording, and sending to the outside world. Both Black Box and Fireball use 3.5mm outputs, allowing me to have small, short audio cables to connect. The Blofeld requires stereo quarter-inch cabling on one end, which then terminates in a stereo 3.5mm jack on the other for plugging into Blue Box. I knew that I didn't want to see a lot of cabling, and that the case itself was a bit smaller than I had hoped. It all looked good on paper, but I forgot to take into account how much room the cables take up as they stick out of the devices. I wouldn't have enough room to have all the synths affixed to the main panel permanently for travel. The Blofeld would have to go somewhere else, then get connected and placed on top for use. I saw that I could prop it up against the cover, which actually made it easier to use. I realized I'd have to make the case have two levels. The upper panel, where the synths are accessed while in use, and a lower compartment, where all the wiring is permanently set up and where the Blofeld is stored for travel. I used thin plywood for the rim that the top panel sits on and for the top panel itself. The rim width was cut to exactly the size of the highest object within the storage compartment, which was the Blofeld. I then cut a piece of plywood for the top panel that fit the dimensions of the case exactly. I put the devices where I wanted them, then laid out holes for all the connections to the bottom compartment. Measuring the various hole sizes, drilling, and then filing or re-drilling to fit took more effort than I had thought, but it eventually was completed. Once done, it was time to wire everything up and make sure it all worked. Surprisingly, it all worked the first time. At that point, I hot glued the power strip to the side of the compartment, then ran the power to the devices. I wired up the MIDI, running a USB cable out to connect up the laptop. The MIDI interface and through box were wired up and velcroed to the floor of the case. I made sure to make room for Blofeld in the bottom compartment. With that set in place, I hot glued foam from the case around it to make sure it would be protected during travel. The bottom was done. On to the top panel. The first task was to lay the devices out where I wanted them. The three 1010 units against the front rim of the case and the Blofeld propped up against the back. With those in place, I marked out where the holes should be to allow the cables from the bottom compartment to attach for use. I also put in a pair of finger holes to easily lift the top panel, a notch for the power cable to exit the briefcase, and a hole for the USB cable to the Mac. I measured the size needed for each hole, then used a drill press to cut them out. I started out pretty conservative with the hole sizes, and it took some iterating and re-drilling to get everything to fit properly. With everything laid out where I wanted it, it was time to test the wiring. I tested the power first, then the MIDI connections, and then the audio. Once everything was confirmed, I used Velcro to affix the MIDI interface and through box to the bottom of the case, then cable ties to neaten up all the wiring. I made sure to leave sufficient length for the cables to fit through the top of the case with a bit of extra room. I used hot glue to glue down the foam compartment for the Blofeld and then painted the top cover a cherry dark green. A couple of coats later, I had to re-drill most of the holes yet again to clear out the paint that had stuck to the sides. I velcroed the 1010 modules into place and was finally done with the hardware build.
There are a couple of improvements I'd like to add at some point. I could cut the power cord and attach the power strip to an IEC inlet on the outside of the case and run an audio output from the blue box down to a pair of quarter inch connectors drilled into the side, but those tasks are for another day. With the hardware complete, it was time to configure the software. First, I created a preset for the blue box, labeling the inputs and getting the relative levels squared away. Every time I power up, the mixer is set to go. Then it was time to configure the MIDI. I have 32 channels to work with, but 16 is enough. The Blofeld and the black box are multi-tambral, while the fireball makes a single sound at a time. I thought about what musical tracks I would need for Berlin school style music, and I came up with the following. Melody, counter melody, bass, drums, two pads, and two ostinati. You know, those sequenced repetitive patterns that are such an important part of the genre. Then, I asked myself what else I could do with the black box. So, an additional MIDI channel to trigger whatever specific samples might come up. And then dedicated channels for two of my most important sounds, the Mellotron flute and the Mellotron string section. I decided to round it out by adding a choral pad channel for the Blofeld. So with that design complete, I made a Reaper template with one track for each MIDI channel and threw the Mega Baby Sequencer plugin on each channel in bypass mode. That way, if I want it for step sequencing, it's there, but I can also use Reaper for more straight ahead linear MIDI recording. I configured the Fireball to its MIDI channel, then tackled the Waldorf Blofeld. It has a special multi-tambral mode that you can create presets for. The UI is a bit cumbersome and very unforgiving, where you can inadvertently select another preset and erase all your work easily. So, save early and often with that unit. I selected default sounds for each of the parts and then tweaked them to fit my taste. The Blofeld has limited CPU capacity, so I set all the parts I wasn't using to the init patch, then turned off the MIDI connections to them. Hopefully, that will maximize polyphony for the parts I do want. Then, it was time to configure the black box, and this took the most tweaking to get right. The reason is that there are multiple ways for pads to receive MIDI, and you have to make sure they don't step on each other, or you will be triggering pads you don't want. I started by loading my Mellotron flute and string samples as multi-samples on two pads. You have to have your sample set in a folder with the file names numbered in numerical order. Then you navigate to that folder as if you were loading a single sample to a pad, but instead of load, you tap file, then load all. If there are sufficient sample slots, Blackbox will load all the samples to that pad as a multi-sample. Blackbox has a maximum of 80 samples at a time, and those multi-samples can eat that up quickly. Then I went into the pad and set the MIDI channel that corresponded to my Reaper track and set polyphony to four notes. Also, the default trigger mode is trigger, which plays the sample all the way to the end. You want to set it to gate in this case, so when you let off the key, the sample goes to the release phase of the envelope, then stops playing. I added a bit of Black Box's onboard delay and reverb through the effects page. Next came the drums. I decided to map those to different pads to allow me to quickly substitute drum sounds and to be able to play them from the Black Box touchscreen. Black Box defaults to the bottom left pad being triggered by MIDI note 36, or C2. They then increment up from there. I loaded up my samples and then tried to configure each pad to a MIDI channel and note number. But this doesn't work because each sample then gets triggered when any key is struck. You have to turn off individual MIDI channels for the pads and go to the MIDI in section of the Tools tab to set the pad channel, in this case to channel 10. At that point, each drum sample triggered properly when its corresponding key was pressed. But there was one more problem. Now, the Mellotron multi-sample instruments were also triggering on that channel as well. The solution was to go into their pads and set the root note all the way to the top of the MIDI note range, getting them out of the way. A little tricky to figure out, but once you understand it, it works. Then I went into the mix and FX pages to configure levels, pan, and reverb for the drum tracks. Saved it as a preset, and I was finally done with the configuration. For now, at least. MIDI CC control of various parameter controls, such as filter cutoff of the Mellotron multi-samples, will follow later.
So if you're still listening, you have gone through my long, arduous, but fun journey of getting this portable electronic music rig designed and configured. Your instruments and designs will be different, but I hope watching this process was inspiring and gave you an idea as to the basic steps required. With all that said, let's wrap up with listening to some preliminary music I created while getting everything operational. I look forward to creating some more polished music with it, but this is a good starting point. So that's it for this episode of Under the Big Tree. As always, if you like what we are doing here, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. So I'll sign off, and let's listen to some music.